right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our morning service. Facebook friends, always an honor uh, having you join us also. If you're able to stand, grab a hymn book in front of you and turn to page 185. Page 185, My Savior's Love. It says, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, wonderful, that my son should ever be. How marvelous, wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Think about it, that amazing love. We don't deserve his love, but he does love us in spite of us. And no matter what we do, no matter how we behave, we displease the Lord. But no matter what, his love for us is unconditional. It never changed. So that's why the Bible tells us to keep yourself in the love of God. So thank God for our Savior's love. He died on the cross. That's what Christmas is all about, right? We got a Savior. That was love. It was love that nailed him to the cross. So when Christ was nailed to the cross, he was thinking about you and I. Think about it. If you were the only sinner born after Adam and Eve, he would have done it just for you. My Savior's love. So let's sing that together as Brother Jerry leads into the song. And just fall in love with the Savior. Thank him in your heart for dying on the cross for you and I. My Savior's love, page 185. Sweet to Trust in Jesus, hymn number 127. Hymn number 127, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to 
trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more oh how sweet to trust in Jesus just to trust his cleansing blood just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood jesus jesus how i trust him how i've proved him or endure jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust him more yes tis sweet to trust in jesus just from sin and self to cease just from jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace jesus jesus how i trust him how i've proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust him more i'm so glad i learned to trust the precious jesus savior friend and i know that thou art with me wilt be with me to the end jesus jesus how i trust him how i've proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust him Man, it's a blessing to trust in Jesus. So sweet to trust in Him. I was thinking of that song, and I was thinking when I'm out there in my secular job and trying to look for opportunities to give a gospel track or share Christ with people, unsaved people. And I usually say this this line: I say, "How's the Lord treating you?" By the way, I'm talking to unsaved person. I'm not even talking to a saved person. I say, "How's the Lord treating you?" And even the old saved person said, "God's been good to me." But I remember asking one guy, I said, how's the Lord treating you? I didn't know he was a Christian. He said, that's not the question. You got the question. The question is, how are you treating the Lord? And I remember that. Because the Lord is good to us all the time. Amen. He's there for us. He never disappoints you. He has not disappointed me this year. We're about to come in a new year. And he will not disappoint you in this new year. But we have disappointed him, right? Many times we don't sweetly trust in him. And uh, we lose faith, but it is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word. Amen. Praise the Lord for Jesus. We ought to love Jesus more this new year coming up. Can you believe 2022 is around the corner? Wow, that means you're older. I'm older, amen. But it's a blessing, and um, I don't think we have any first-time visitors today. Everybody looks regular. But we got good to see Jose and Alma. This is the second time that they come, and it's good to see them. And they look great. Good to see you guys. And then it's good to see my daughter and my son-in-law, Angel, Cynthia, and my beautiful grandchildren. And uh, we're having a blast, a good time, uh, spending time with them, spending Christmas with them. So it's good to see them. If you haven't met my, my daughter, that's my beautiful daughter there. And if you, like, if you look at my granddaughter, Jari, Cynthia looked just like her when she was little. I heard that already from people when they saw Jari. 
It's true. They're twins. You see a picture, but it's good to see them. Amen. And let's, hey, let's continue to press on for Jesus. Amen. And let's, uh, uh, let's ask the Lord to plant our feet on high ground for this new year. And let's love him more. Amen. Let's trust him more. Let's praise him more. And let's continue to give out the gospel. Let's continue to give out the gospel tracts and go out. And I want to thank you all for those who do go out, who keep grabbing uh, those gospel tracts and going out uh, Saturdays and during the week and just going out knocking doors. Well, that, don't stop that. Amen. Let's continue that this new year. So we're going to take the offering now. And in the, uh, uh, if you're visiting this morning, this is not for you. The offering is only for the regular God's people. So let the, play, let the play pass by. We're not here to take your money. We're happy you're here. We just want to minister to your heart. We want to encourage you with the word of God. So, man, will you come? And we will pray for the offering and the message that follow. Good to see Gail back. I'm glad you're feeling better. You look, you look great. I know she was struggling you know, with her health a little bit. We, we were praying for you, and it's good to see you back. Uh, let's pray and ask the Lord to meet with us. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, uh, we thank you for, uh, Lord, uh, almost the new year, 2022 is almost here. And Lord, and uh, you, thank you for the victories, the blessings that you have given us in, th in this year, Lord. You've been good to us. Uh, Lord, and um, uh, may we continue to keep our eyes on Jesus, Lord, this new year, even more. Lord, because struggles are coming this new year. Battles are coming this new year. Challenges, new challenges are coming this new year. But the Lord tells us in his word, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's with us. We got his presence. God with us. And Lord, uh, we want to feel your presence this morning in the service. All it takes is two or three to be gathered in your name and you're in the midst of us. We cover your presence. We invite you here. Bless the offering. Bless the giver. Bless the message, Lord. And may your name be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Please stand if you're able for our third hymn this morning, which is number 101, Jesus Never Fails. Hymn number 101, Jesus Never Fails. Jesus 
standing for the reading of God's word, which is in the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 11, starting at verse 10, reading to verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 10 through 12. So in Deuteronomy chapter 11, starting in verse 10, the scripture reads, For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt from whence ye came out, where thou sowedest thy seed and waterest it with thy and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land whither, the, whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. Amen. Please be seated. Right. If you have your Bibles open, I hope you do have your Bibles open. We like to use our Bibles here, amen. I love to hear those pages turn. So if you got you got your Bibles open, I want to share some thoughts this morning for the new year. And I want to use uh, the thoughts from Moses. Here in our text, this is Moses' last speech to the children of Israel as they say goodbye to the old life and as they are about to enter into the promised land. And I believe there are some important lessons for us here between the nation of Israel going to the promised land and us entering to the new year of 2022. There are parallels. There are some applications for us from our text this morning. So the title of my message this morning is A Land of Hills and Valleys. A Land of Hills and Valleys. So I could title the message Good Cheer for the New Year. So the Land of Hills and Valleys. That's the title of the message this morning. And let's uh, join me in prayer. As I pray, you pray silently that the Lord will use me and speak to your heart like if it was just you and God here in this, in this room. So join me in prayer. Let's bow our head for prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word, your infallible, flawless, perfect word. Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you gave us this year in our church. We pray that this new year, we as a church, will bear much fruit, and much fruit that, mean, that remain for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, give us a greater appetite for your word this new year, Lord. Lord, give us a greater effectiveness in our service for you this new year. Give us a, 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 a word of encouragement, Lord, for your word this morning as we are facing in just in a few days as we are saying goodbye to the old year and we're going to enter a new year. Lord, may we trust in you more just like we heard the hymn. So sweet to trust in Jesus. May we trust you more sweetly. This new year, Lord, may you increase our faith, our trust in the Lord, our uh, following God's promises and standing on God's promises more. Lord, just bless the message uh, because there's power in the Word of God, Lord, in spite of me. I'm, I'm, I'm only a sinner saved by grace trying to challenge all the sinners to live for God, to increase their commitment for God, Lord. And I pray that you help me to put the emphasis where it's needed. Lord, help us to not miss the message, remove distractions. I know Satan likes to hinder, the enemy likes to hinder. And may each one of us do not miss the message that you have for us this morning. Help me to... Deliver in power and demonstration in power and spirit. Make it clear. Lord, we need to hear from you, not from man. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Look with me as we read Deuteronomy chapter 11, in verse 10 to 12. It says, for the, Lord, for the land, whether thou goest to possess it, is not as the land of Egypt. For whence you came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest with thy foot as a guarding of herbs. Verse 11, but the land, whether you go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys. And, and, and that's, that's how I got the title, the land of hills and valleys. It says, in the land of hills and valleys, and drink it water of the rain of heaven. Verse 12, a land which the Lord thy God care for, the eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And that's what I want to focus in verses uh, 11 through 12. Moses here is reciting for the children of Israel the Lord of God. Deuteronomy is the second law given to the nation of Israel. Moses is an old man. He's an old man here. He's going to turn things over to Joshua. And Joshua is going to lead them to the promised land. The land flowing with milk and honey. The generation that have sinned against God have died off. And a new generation have come upon the scene. And they're about to enter into the promised land. So Moses is reminding them what God has done for them of the blessings of God, the goodness of God. He's reminded them and he's telling them to be obedient to the Lord. Continue to be obedient to God and to keep his commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And he tells them that in verse 13, and it shall come to pass if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul because if you do that God's gonna bless you God will bless them God will guide them God will provide for them as they are entering into the new land by the way that God is our God too and he, he did that for them he would do that for us amen he would do that but um he describes it this new land that is not as the land of Egypt. If you notice in verse 10, for their land, whether thou goest in to possess it, is not as the land of Egypt. It's not like the land of Egypt, which was boring and, and dead and dry and, and where they were in bondage of, of slaves. slaves uh, 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 there were slaves and they were being mistreated called by Pharaoh. No, this is not like, by the way, the, the Egypt represents the world, right? The Bible said that Egypt represents the world when we were in bondage of sin. And that's the past for us. So, and then he says that it's not as the land of Egypt. In verse 11, but the land which you go to possess it, it is the land of hills and valleys. And drink of water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God cared for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year, even to the end of the year. And I believe there, there's a lot of mar marvelous parallels between the nation of Israel and the Christian today here. I believe there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's an application for us here. And you're going to see some parallels here. Like Israel, like Israel we will redeem from the bondage of sin. Egypt <clears throat> uh, um, is, a, is, a t is typical of the old life. As Israel had to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, so you and I had to be redeemed out of the bondage of our sinful past by the blood of Jesus Christ. You and I, so there's parallel there. Like Israel could not be led into the promised land by Moses, because Moses represented the law, but by Joshua, who represents that our Jesus, so we are led into the land of milk, flowing with milk and honey. So we see here, we come to, we come to the Jordan River, which is the typical of death, we die to self and we enter into the spiritual life, the life of abundance, the life of blessing. And I believe with all my heart that God, this new year, 
wants us to experience the abundant life, the life of blessings, the life that is filled with milk and honey, which means God's blessing. God does not want us to be in the flesh. God wants us to be in the spirit. Amen? In the spirit. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, walk in the spirit, and you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's how God wants us to live this new year. That should be our goal, walking in the spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. God wants to fill us and empower us with his Holy Spirit as we walk in the abundant life of his blessings this coming new year. But I want you to notice in these verses, in verse 10 here of um, uh, the Deuteronomy chapter 11, in verse 10, we see here that we, there's a parallel here that we come out of the land of Egypt like Israel. They're coming out of the land of Egypt. But guess what? We come out of the land of Egypt like Israel. In verse 11, we enter into the new land, a land of hills and valleys. In verse 12, it's a land that God cares for and his eyes are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And I cannot think of a more fitting description of a Christian life going from the old year, going into the new year. This is a, a very fitting description. Let's look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. But the land, whether you go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys. Doesn't that describe the Christian life? Have you discovered that living the Christian life in this land is filled with valleys and hills? Have anybody experienced that? I have experienced it. Living in this land... The Christian life is filled with valleys and hills. Life has its valleys and hills. Life is full of valleys and life is full of mountaintop experiences. You know, some people think that the Christian life is an easy life. That, you know, when you give your, your life to Christ, there will be no problem, there will be no difficulties, there will be no hardship, no struggle. It's all mountaintop experience. No, that's not promised in the, in the Word of God. That is not promised in the Word of God. And that's not, that, we as God's people, we, we, we don't go from mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop. We want that, but that's not guaranteeing the Christian life. There's going to be valleys. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be difficulties. We know from God's word and from experience that that's not true. In every life, uh, uh, into every life, storms and valleys will come. It's going to come. You had them this year, and you're glad that it's over. Well, get, buckle up. They're coming this new year. Buckle up because new battles, new struggles, new challenges are coming this new year. And I'll let Jesus predict the new year for you and I. From John chapter 16 in verse 33. Let Jesus predict our new year, 2022, for each one of us. Here it is. Here. Here's Jesus wishing you happy new year. You ready? John chapter 16, verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Now, we like that one, right? I like peace in Jesus. Anybody like peace in Jesus? I like tranquility. I like rest in Jesus. You know? It, 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 these things have I written, I've spoken unto you, John 16, 33, that in me you might have peace. We like that one. Peace in Jesus. But we don't like how the verse continues. In the world, you should have tribulation. Look, that's Jesus' New Year's prediction for you and I. This New Year time, you will have tribulation you will be in the valley. Amen? You will experience difficulties and storms. No, we don't like that one, right? But then he goes on, and he says, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. There is the, the good cheer for the new year from Jesus. Amen? Look, you're going to experience valleys. You're going to experience tribulation and storms and trials and testings and tough times and hard times. You're going to experience uh, struggles. Difficult time, but Jesus says, cheer up. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And you know, with Jesus, we are overcomers. With Jesus, we are more than conquerors. With Jesus, we can't overcome any valley, any stress, any hard time and difficult time in store, because with him, you, we could overcome it through him, because he will empower us, and I can do all things through Christ, which strength is me. Amen? Just stay close to him this new year, closer than what you, that you have this year. That'll be our goal. That'll, that'll be a good New Year's resolution. 
I want to strengthen my walk with God this new year. Amen? I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to increase my, my, my Bible knowledge. I want to, I want to uh, increase my Bible reading. I want to increase my prayer life. Wouldn't that be good? That's pleasing to the Lord. Amen? That will be very pleasing to the Lord. Look, this new year, we will face valleys. Mark it down. We're going to face valleys this new year. Have you ever noticed that most of the great people in the Bible, the great Christians that we look up to, most of them, you see them a lot in the Hebrews chapter 11, the heroes of our faith. You ever noticed that most of them uh, in the Bible went through valleys in their life? They went through valleys. You want God to use you, he's going to put you in the valley. You want God to stretch your faith and, and, and empower you and multiply your effectiveness, he's going to have to put you in the valley. He's going to have to bring you low before he could bring you up. Amen? That's what I see in the scriptures. I see a pattern in the scriptures of all the great women of God, the great men of God. They all went, they all went through valleys in their life. I think of David. The minute God poured his spirit upon David, remember Samuel the prophet poured the oil on David, and the spirit came upon that David from that day forward. It was, it was once God laid his hand on him, Samuel, and God's power and God's spirit came upon him from forward. That's when the valleys and the battles for David began. That's when Saul began to be jealous of him. Remember Saul? Jealous Saul began to be jealous of him. He began to attack him, to try to harm him, to try to kill him. David began to hide in caves from jealous Saul. He was, David had to flee for his life. Saul kept chasing David like a wild animal. And at time, David got very discouraged. You ever got very discouraged? Have you been very discouraged this year? Well, guess what? There's going to be no new discouragement this new year. Mark it down. Make room for that, amen? Look, David, look, David, as soon as the Spirit of God came upon him, I mean, that's a mountain-time experience. Why? When, when Annual poured the oil on him, mountain, mountain spirit. But as soon as the Spirit of God came upon him, from that day forward, he began to face battles, and he went to be, to be in the valley and suffering because Saul was attacking him, and he had to hide himself from Saul, jealous Saul, because Saul wanted to kill him and take his life. And David, during those moments when he was in the valley, he became very discouraged. In Psalm 42, listen to his discouragement. He was very discouraged in Psalm 42. In verse 5, look what David says. Psalm 42, verse 5. Why art thou cast down? He's preaching a sermon to himself while he's discouraged. He says, why? Psalm 42, 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieting in me? And then he says, hope thou in God. For I should yet praise him for the help of his continent. So David could only ask himself why he had allowed himself to be so discouraged. But bless God, David doesn't stay discouraged. He doesn't stay in the valley. He doesn't stay in the pity party. You know, you're going to get there. Trust me, I don't care how spiritual you are. David was a very spiritual man. Greater men than you and I were in the valley discouraged. Ready to throw in the towel. Jeremiah was one of them. But don't stay there. Amen. David was so discouraged, but he did not stay in the valley. He did not stay discouraged. He's asking himself why he allowed himself to be so discouraged. But David doesn't stay discouraged. He preaches to himself. He says, hope thou in God. That's what he says. He's encouraged himself in the Lord. Hope thyself in God. You need to hope. You lost hope in God. You lost trust in God. You lost faith. That's why you're discouraged. You got your eyes of the Lord. It's just like the hymn. The hymn tells us that we, we send here, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the life of his glory and grace. Basically, he's saying something similar like that. Uh, Hope thou in God, for I should yet praise him for the help of his countenance. He starts praising God. David, after he's discovered, he lifted himself up. He, just, he started praising God for the help of his countenance. So the help of God's countenance, that reference of God's countenance refers, I believe, to God's face. The thought is of God looking kindly upon him. Look, when we face valleys this new year, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Hope thou in God, just like David did. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look wonderful, his wonderful face, and the things on earth should glow. Look upon Jesus this new year when you face trial. And count upon Jesus' smiling face, looking favorably upon us and kindly upon us. Look, learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord your God this new year. Amen? Look, I'm going to do my best to pump you up. To use the word of God and stand here and, 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 and motivate you so you can keep your eyes on Christ. But you got to learn how to motivate yourself. 
I'll motivate you Sunday morning. I'll motivate you tonight. I'll motivate you Wednesday, but you got to learn how to motivate yourself Monday. I'm not going to be there Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Amen? David did that. He got discouraged. He went through the valley. He knew life was full of valleys and hills. He was on top side, but he was in the valley. But he didn't stay down in the valley. You're going to experience that this new year, but don't stay there. Get out of there, man. Get out of there and encourage yourself in the Lord. David did it. First Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. It starts with this verse. And David was greatly distressed. That sounds like he's in the valley. He's in the dumps. But then the, the verse doesn't, he don't stay there. First Samuel 36 begins... But David was greatly, not just distressed, but greatly distressed. But then the verse ends, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Hallelujah. That's why we need to learn this new year. Learn how to motivate yourself in the Lord. Learn how to stand in God's promises and start going by feelings and looking at your circumstances. And look to Jesus. Hope thou in God. When you're cast down like the psalmist is. So God has to bring David way down before God could lift David up. I mean, you see great men in the Bible, they went. If you look at their life, great people in the Bible went through valleys in their life. And we saw King David. I think of Moses. Moses, the one that's giving our, our, our text today. In, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 13 and 13, he's, he's the one that's telling us that the land is a land of hills and valleys. That's the Christian life. He's the one that's giving us this. Moses was considered to be one of the greatest human leaders of the history of mankind. He was a great man of God. He was a great, humble uh, uh, servant of God, Moses. Moses tried to deliver the children of Israel by killing one Egyptian. He was accused of murder. He had to flee for his life. He became a shepherd in the desert of Midian for 40 years. God had to humble him and break him and bring him down. For the next 40 years, Moses had to go around in circles in the, in the desert, uh, uh, leading those whiners, those complainers, maybe a couple million of them, who kept complaining and whining to him and uh, getting on his nerves for 40 years. He had to go through that. And, uh, and, and he never got into the promised land. What am I saying? God had to break Moses and bring him down before God could lift Moses up. You want God to lift you up this new year? He's going to have to bring you down. He's going to have to put you in the valley. He's going to have to put you in the fire. He's going to have to do that. He did it. But Moses saw the glory of God, bless God. Even though he was in the valley, Moses saw the glory of God in the mountaintop. When God gave him the Ten Commandments, Moses, the Bible says that Moses' face was glowing from the presence of God. Look, there are valleys and hills in David's life. There were valleys and hills in Moses' life. And there will be valleys and hills in your life, too. Make room for that, amen? I'm trying to prepare you for the challenges coming this new year, for the struggles and the battles this new year. Look, I think of the Apostle Paul. He, he's one of my mentors. He's my, my, apart from Jesus, my number one mentor. He was an incredible man of God. He showed me a lot about the Christian life. He showed me a lot about, about staying in topside and staying um, focused on the Lord by looking at the life of Paul. He's the pattern for us. By the way, he, he, he was a human just like you. He had weakness just like you. He felt like quitting just like you. He got discouraged just like you. He was no superhuman. He was a super Christian because he trusted the Lord. Amen? He didn't stay in the valley. And Paul, the apostle Paul, wrote these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. He was in the valley. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, the apostle Paul said this. For we will not, for we will not brethren... Have you ignorance of our trouble which came to us in Asia? That we were pressed out of measure above strength. In as much that we despair even of life. Think about that. Second chapter 1 verse 8. Think about that. Paul said we were pressed out of measure above strength. This was a big trial. Paul said, God, you're giving me something I cannot handle. This is too heavy for us. We're done. This is the end of the road. We're at the end of the road. There's no way to escape out of this one. In as much that we despair even of life. Here's the Apostle Paul. We see the Apostle Paul down in the dumps. He's down in the dump in the valley. But there was all the time when Paul was in the hill, in the mountaintop. He was in the hill. We see Paul caught up in the third heaven. 
He was caught up in the third heaven, so we see him in the valley, but at the same time we see him where he was caught up. God gave him a revelation. He was caught up in the third heaven. I believe he died. He literally died and, got, and went to heaven. God brought him back. Can you imagine being in heaven and then coming back? And um, Paul, so look, what am I saying? I'm saying that this Christian life, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 11 describes a land of hills and valleys. That is describing our general Christian life. Our life consists of hills and valleys. That's going to be our Christian life. That describes our Christian life. Every one of us this coming year will face valleys and hills. We will face difficulties and hardships and storms. Why does God allow valleys and hills in our life? Well, let me give you a few simple reasons why God allows valleys and hills in our life. He allowed them this year. And he's going to allow them the new year. But let me, tell, let me give you a reason why we've got to allow some simple reason. Number one, let me give them to you. We need to remember that God is the one who permits, and God is in control of them, and God has a purpose in them. God permits them, God controls them, and God has a purpose in each one of them. God permits them, God controls them, and God has a purpose in them. Look, this morning, if you're a child of God, you could take this to the bank with much absolute assurance. Nothing can happen to us this new year that has not the control of God. Nothing can happen this year that has not the permission of God and the purpose of God. Take it to the bank. Mark it down if you're a child of God. Mark it down. You may not understand what God is doing. You may not even see how God is working. And that's why the Bible says we're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. We don't walk by, by sight. You'll be a mess. You'll be depressed. You'll be, you be feeling sorry for yourself in the pity party. You'll be, you be, you be miserable. You'll be a disaster. No, we, so even if you don't understand God and you don't see God at work, God is still working silently behind the scenes even when you're in the valley. Amen? You're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. That's what the Scripture tells us. So... <clears throat> We should never doubt in the dark what God has spoken in the light. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He meant that too. God meant that. The God that cannot lie. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Why are you worrying about it? Why are you so straight? Why are you so fearful about it? He said, he'll never leave you. That's, pretty, that's good enough for me, that promise. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee, period. Amen? When is he going to leave you? Never. When is he going to forsake you? Never, if you're safe. Amen? Matthew 28, remember when he gave the great commission to go, to go uh, uh, preach the gospel and, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And they said, Lo, I am with you even into the end of the world. We, we know this world is ending. We're in the last days, but he's with you even into the end of the world. Amen? Get a hold of that. Amen? We need to get a hold of that. In our text in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 12, a land which the Lord thy God cared for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it. God cares, my friend. God cares for you, amen? He does care. Uh, he says there, he cared for the nation of Israel. I'm going to take you out of Egypt, but I'm going to put you in a new land, and I got, my eyes are upon it always, and I'm going to care for you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to take care of you. He would do that for us too. He would do that First Peter 5, 7, casting your cares upon him, for he care for you. God will take care of you. God will watch over you. Nothing will happen to you that has not the control of God. Nothing will happen to you that have the permission of God and the purpose of God. We need to rest in God's providential care. We need to rest in God's providential care. Look, so God... Why God allow trials and valleys in our life? I believe because God is the one that will permit them, control them, and he has purpose in each one of them. That should be joy to you. That, that, that'll cheer you up, amen? Be a good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the world, you should have tribulation in me. You can, that will give you peace. Knowing that God is in control, he has, uh, he's permitting them, he's controlling them, and he has a purpose in every trial of your life. That will give you his peace, my friend. Amen? 
why God does not allow valleys this new year. I'll tell you why. Number two, because we learn lessons in the valleys that we can never learn on the mountaintops. We learn lessons in the valleys that we can never learn in the mountaintops. There are lessons to be learned in the valley that could never be learned on the mountaintops. You say, well, I don't want to learn those lessons in the valleys. God, just keep me in the mountaintops, Lord. That's what we want, right? Right? That sounds better, right? But it's not going to happen. God's not going to guarantee you that. He's going to give you mountaintop, but before you get to the mountaintop, you got to get to the valley first. In that order, amen? In that order. Anybody home? Anybody uh, 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 grasping this? Look, we learn lessons in the valleys that we could never learn in the mountaintops. And sometimes we say, God, I just want to remove the valleys, Lord. Remove the testing and the trials and the hardship and the difficult time. Lord, I want the sunshine. I want the blessings. I want the showers of blessings. No. Listen, where did King David learn how not to fear? Not in the mountaintop. In the valley. Amen? Where did he learn not to fear? Not in the mountaintop. In the valley. In the valley. Psalm 23. Verse 4, listen to it. Psalm 23, verse 4. Yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So when I'm walking through a valley of deep darkness, David learned that God was with him. He knew that God was present there. And God removed his fear because of the Lord's presence. Amen. Listen to this, to, this morning. I don't know what you're going to face today, later on, tomorrow. The next week or the new year, but you will face valleys, you will face challenges, you will face difficult times, hearted, and you know, don't be afraid. Amen? Don't be afraid when you're in the valley. He's there. His presence is there. Amen? Whether you go to the doctor to give you bad news, he's there. Whether you get sick or, or, or you need surgery, uh, I don't need to be afraid. He is there. Look, I learned... God is with me in the valley, not in the mountaintop. That's why you're going to learn God is with you in the valley, not in the mountaintop. John Bunyan, you heard about John Bunyan, right? John Bunyan says, in time of affliction, we meet with the sweetest experiences of the love of God. And John Bunyan said that when he was in the valley. He was in the valley. So he says, in time of affliction, we meet with the sweetest experiences of the love of God. I believe that is so true. There's a depth of fellowship we have with Christ when we are in the valleys that we don't have in the mountaintop. You know that? I learned that from my spirit, and I see a lot of Christians in the Bible, like the Apostle Paul, who learned that. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, but don't stop there. And then he goes on and says, Brother Jerry, and the fellowship of his suffering. When you're in the valley, that's when God reveals himself to you, amen, when you look to the Lord. That's where God is going to reveal himself to you more, not in the mountains, in the valley. That's what Paul experienced, the suffering of Christ. He suffered like Christ suffered, and, and it drew him so close to the Lord, he felt God's presence and God's touch and God's power upon his life. Jeremiah is another example. He was called the weeping prophet. You know Jeremiah did a lot of weeping. He was called the weeping prophet, and you know it was in the valley that Jeremiah learned in Lamentation 3, 22 and 23. He was in the valley, the weeping prophet. He was in the dumps. And Jeremiah learned about God's mercies. They're new every morning. His compassion fell not. Great is thy faithfulness. Lamentation 3, 22, 23. It is of the Lord's mercy that will not consume because his compassion fell not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You know what he learned that? In the valley. In the valley. He learned while he was in the valley. Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great mighty things which thou knowest not. You know what he learned that? Not in the mountain, in the valley. In the valley he heard God answers prayer. Notice again in Deuteronomy chapter 11, in verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 12, a land which the Lord thy God cared for. 
The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it. Watch this. From the beginning of the year, even into the end of the year. Wow. Just like God cared for them and God provided for them and God was with them and God guided them from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, guess what? Same God we serve. He will do it for you and I. Don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. Amen? Hope, doubt, and God when you get cast down, when you get discouraged. But I learned three things there from that passage of Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 12. I learned three things there. I read it to you again. A land which the Lord thy God cared for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are upon, always upon it. From the beginning of the year, even into the end of the year. I will say there are three things we learn in the valley. While we're in the valley from this passage, we learn first God's provision. God's provision we learn there. Notice a land which the Lord thy God care for. So we learn three things there. We learn first God's provision. God care for us. God is in control. God will provide for us. I love Philippians 419. But my God should supply all your needs, not some of them, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know that's the bank that never fails right there? Philippians 419. Hey, look up here. Look up here. I'm preaching. Amen. I'm trying to change your life. I want to help you in the new years. There's going to be new challenges. Listen, so we see here, there are three, as we learn in the valley, three things. We learn God's provision. Whatever this new year holds, God is your provider. Look to the Lord. He will not disappoint you. Look at his strength. Don't look at your own strength. Don't look at your own resources. Don't look at your own ability. You will be disappointed. You don't look to man. Man will disappoint you. The arm of flesh will fail you, but the arm of omnipotence will never fail you. He will never disappoint you. Amen? Don't look to man. Don't look to your own ability and resources. Look to God. He's powerful, amen? He's all power, and he will not disappoint you, my friend. There's many people that have disappointed us, right? Have you had anybody disappointing you? Man and woman, humans will disappoint you. God will never disappoint you, amen? He will never disappoint you. So look to God who cares and whose eyes are upon you always, just like his eyes was upon them, always. Hope thou in God, like the, the David said in Psalm 42, 5. God will not let you down. God will not disappoint you. Mark it down. Take it to the bank. Man, if you just get a hold of that, it will transform your life, your thinking. Now you're going to have a biblical perspective coming in this new year. God will never disappoint you. I've been serving Christ for over 25 years. It gets sweeter. Yes, I'm in the valley. I get valleys. But I, 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 I encourage myself in the Lord. I don't stay in the valley. I hope in God. I trust him because he will provide for me. And he has always provided for me. And he never let me down even when I let him down. Amen. So we learn three things when we're in the valley. Just from that verse, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 12, we learn God's provision. Number two, we learn God's protection. We learn God's protection. It says, the eyes of the Lord, thy guard always upon it. It means that God is watching us. We are under his, always under his supervision. God, you know what that means? Say, person, God loves you so much that he can't take his eyes off you. Isn't that deep? God loves you. You know, my, my son-in-law, Angel, I know he loves his, his children. He, he'll die for them. He loves them. He's overprotected. He loves them to death. He wants the best for them. And you know what? And my daughter, too. And they got their eyes on them all the time, watching over them. Because that's love. And God does the same thing for us, even, even better than humans do to the children. God loves you so much that he will not get his eyes off you. Isn't that wonderful? That's very encouraging. Amen? That's very encouraging. That's deep. Jeremiah 23 Verse 24, God says, Can any hide himself in secret places that I should not see him, says the Lord. By the way, God, you can't hide from God. God. God's watching over you. His, look, it says that his, his eyes are upon us always. His eyes are upon us. So that reminds us there, Jeremiah 23, 24, Nobody could hide himself in secret places that I should not see him. Say it the Lord. That, this reminder that we need to always do the right thing all the time because God is always watching us. Amen. Let's do the right thing. Let's, uh, uh, let's go to the right places. 
Let's be in the right places and do the right thing. Oh, because nobody's watching. You can fool everybody else, but you can't fool God Almighty. He's watching. Amen. Those holy eyes are watching everything you do. And if you get a hold of that, you'll behave. You'll be a holy Christian. You keep your life clean. I will keep my life clean. Amen. And that's what we need to do. He's always with us, always. He's watching me, always to protect me and protect you. But then I learned a third thing there from that verb. Not only we learn God's provision, not only we learn God's protection, but we also learn in the valley God's presence. We learn God's presence. Look what it says there. Because I have his presence at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 12, The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even into the end of the year. That's very encouraging. I know I'm going to face valleys this new year. That's going to be very encouraging that God's presence is with me always. Always. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, you know what I look about Romans chapter 8? I told Romans chapter 8 verse by verse, and I enjoyed it. But Romans chapter 8, you know what it began? No, it began with no condemnation. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, therefore, therefore, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That means you will never be damned to hell if you're saved. You're secure in the hands of Christ. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Nobody could pluck you out of my hand. You're locked out of hell forever. Think you got it bad? No, you don't got it that bad. You, if you would have went to hell when you die, if you died in your sin, that's real bad. And if he saved you by his grace, you don't have it that bad. So whatever you're going through is nothing compared to the agony in hell. Amen? So you're a blessed woman and you're a blessed man if you're saved this morning. If you're not saved, you got big problems. You're walking on thin ice. But... Romans chapter 8 starts with therefore no condemnation. And then right in the middle is, is the, the great verse, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God. Many times we claim that verse, right? But then it ends that nothing could separate us from the love of God. He's there. We got his presence. Nothing could separate us from the love of God. Nothing. From the beginning to the end of the year, I have his provision, his protection, his presence. God loves us so much to keep us in the mountaintop. So he allows the valleys in our lives so he can teach us lessons we can learn in the valley so we could, that we cannot learn in the mountaintops. That's why God allows it because you cannot learn the lesson that God wants to give you in the mountaintops. You're going to learn them in the valleys. God permits the valleys in our life so we can grow in Christian character and Christ likeness. This is another reason why God allows valleys in our life. God permits the valleys in our lives so we can grow in Christian character and Christ likeness. And that's why your values, listen to this, that's why your values are so important. If you value comfort over character, then your valleys, then when you are in, your, in the valley and trials, you know what they're going to do? They're going to upset you. They're going to upset you, but if you value character over comfort, then your valleys and trials won't upset you because you will embrace them and use them to grow your Christian character and to grow your Christ-likeness. See, a lot of us like to value comfort over character. Well, God values character over comfort. And God is going to allow those trials, those valleys, to form you and to build uh, 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 your Christian character and Christian maturity and Christ-likeness on you. That's the whole goal of the Christian life is to be like Jesus. Amen? He's the one that we need to imitate, Christ. And if everybody has that goal this new year, I want to be like Christ, we live in a better world. We, we have better harmony, we'll get along better. Amen? That's what we need to do. Somebody said the same sun that melts the wax hard in the clay. Some, same trial, same valley, somebody will go to the same trial in the same valley, somebody will, and, and they go to the same trial, the same valley, but it will make that person hard and bitter. And then the other person go to the same trial, but it will become soft, humble, and strong spiritually. It all depends how we respond to the values of our life. Let me ask you this. The value of God, is the value of God that God is allowing in your life is making you hard? Is it make you bitter? Is it make you better? Is it making you hard? Is it making you soft? Are they making you grow in your Christian character? Are they making you grow in your Christian like in your Christ likeness? And I believe that we need to allow God 
to mold us and shape us after his image. That's what we need to allow God. In the valley, we learn a lot of things, a lot of lessons in the valley. But let me just give you some things that we learn in the valley. We learn patience in the valley. You know that? Anybody need patience? Who needs patience? I'm going to show you God this scripture how to get patient. In the valley, not in the mountaintop. In the valley is where you learn patience. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. This is where you're going to learn patience in the valley. Here we go. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Listen to it. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Also, knowing that tribulation work it patient. I'll read it again. Knowing that tribulation work it. I think I only got one person. No, nobody else like to, wants to quote it, huh? Nobody else likes to. You rather quote Philippians 4:19, right? My God shall supply all your needs according to His in glory. But you'll quote that one quick. But you don't want to quote this one, right? That's exactly how you get patient. God is going to have to increase tribulation in your life. I didn't say it. God said it. It's like the old, there was a younger pastor. He wanted it. He was lacking patience. He was struggling with patience. And he went to the older senior pastor who had more experience in the Christian life. And he said, pray for me. I need patience. And the senior pastor who has more experience than him, Lay his hand on his, said, Lord, bless this young pastor. Lord, send trials and storm and tribulation and pressure and hard times. Stop, stop. I didn't ask for that. You misunderstood me. I said patience. I said, well, that's what the Bible says. He quoted Romans 5, 3, tribulation, work of patience. Amen. That's how you're going to get patient. That's how God developed patience in your life. Amen. By the way, this is not, there's no shortcuts to it. Tribulation, work of patience, there's no shortcuts. You get patient, you don't get patient by reading a book. Well, I'm going to, read, go, to, I'm going to go to the library or I'm going to buy a book on Amazon that says how to, how to get patient and you get a secular book that says 12 lessons, how to get patient. No. That's not how, or, or going to some kind of weekend conference. No. The word patient has the idea of endurance there. The word patient there is not talking about when you're sitting in a traffic light, patiently waiting. And you're smiling in the traffic light, and there's a delayed red light, or maybe in um, in a Goodwin Street and, and Smith Street that stop sign. I can't stand the stop sign. They had to put a red light in there. You know what I'm talking about? By the Jehovah Witness Hall, Goodwin Street, Perf Hamboy here, and, and 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 Smith Street, they need to put a, a, a light there. You get very impatient there. There's many times that I turn around, but look, that's not talking about that kind of patience. Well, you just sit in there and go in street and stop sign and, and, and there's, there's people that just take their sweet time and, and you got to get there a certain time and you're smiling patiently. That's not talking about that. That word patient means endurance. It is not talking about patient, like waiting patiently in traffic light or a stop sign. It has the idea in the face of opposition. We press on. We keep moving forward. We endure. And the only way we can develop endurance is in the valley it's in opposition. That's how God builds endurance in your life. Amen? You want endurance? Well, God's going to have to increase valleys in your life. Opposition. That's how, you, that's how you grow. That's how you mature. Amen? That's how you become like Christ. You grow in your Christian character and your Christ-likeness. But we want to pray, Lord, make my life easy. Take away all the valleys and opposition. Take away the thorns. Lord, give me mountaintops only. No, in the valley, we learn patience, my friend. That's God's prescription. We learn patience in the valley. Also, not only in the valley, not only in the, lab, in the, in the, in the, in the valley we learn patience, but also in the valley we learn humility too. We learn humility. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, listen to this. Second chapter 12, verse 7, the apostle Paul said, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And Paul had a revelation. I believe he was caught up to the third heaven. He was caught up to the third heaven, the Bible says. I mean, he, he, was, in, he, he, he was in heaven. He saw the beauty of heaven, and you know what? God had to send that thorn in the flesh because that could have got him proud. I wonder how many people, Brother Jerry, would have that experience that Paul was cut up to him. I wonder how many books they write. 
How many books would they write today? Probably would be the, uh, the number one bestseller on Amazon. But he didn't do it. He didn't talk about it for many years. He's too quiet. And you know what? God had a sin that thorn in the flesh. Who sent them? Who gave them that thorn in the flesh? According to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Who gave it to him? I believe God gave it to him. Well, you say, well, it was the messenger of Satan. Well, God controls the devil too. God could allow the devil's attacks on your life. He said, take your life to keep you humble so you could depend upon God. God would do that. Amen? God did that to keep him humble. And God would allow, God, look, God allowed Satan to afflict Job to humble him and to keep, keep him usable for God. Who afflicted Job with those boils in his body? Satan. And God gave him permission, right? But God was controlling the devil. So God would afflict you also. He will even allow the enemy to attack you and afflict you. Why? God wants to keep you humble. So if you're struggling with a physical problem, praise God for it. He's trying to keep you humble. We didn't like that one either, huh? But God used humble people. They're usable for God, amen? God can't use proud people. He's going to have to bring you down, amen? He's going to have to afflict you, put you in the valley. Because I believe God loves us so much that he allows suffering in our life to keep us humble. He knows that we need that, to walk humbly before our God. So he allows valleys in our life. By the way, that's more important than living in the mountaintop all the time. You know what happens if God would allow you to live in the mountaintop with no valleys and no trial? You're going to get proud. You're going you're gonna to distance yourself from God, my friend. Because I, I read in the scripture that God makes people prosper and they turn their back on God. Amen? That's why God afflicts you. God got a lot of trials in the valley so you could depend on him to keep you humble. Amen? I think of King Uzziah in Second Chronicles somewhere. He was a king. He began to reign. I think he was like 16 years old. And God blessed him and, and he was seeking the Lord as his fathers did. And God prospered him. And God helped him. And God made him strong. And you know what happened? He got proud. He got puffed up. He turned his back on God and God had to afflict him with leprosy. He died as a leper. Be careful when God prosper you. Amen? When God give you a nice job and a nice income, you got nice finances, and you got a nice home, be careful. Don't forget who gave you that. Amen? Don't forget that every good gift and perfect gift from above, and when you come down from the Father of don't forget that the Lord give it, the Lord could take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen? So look, I believe living in the mountaintop all the time will cause us to distance ourselves from God. In the valley, we learn last. Let me give you the last one. In the valley, we learn to sympathize. To, I'm, I'm sorry. In the valley, we learn to be sympathetic and compassionate towards others. Let me show you 2 Corinthians chapter 1, last, last point. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Look what it says. In the valley, we learn to be sympathetic and compassionate towards others. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. I love that. The God of all comfort who comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort when we ourselves are comforted of God. You want to encourage other people and heal their wounds, then you're going to have to suffer. You're going to have to suffer. Then you can't go to them and say, hey, God did it for me. He could do it for you. I was in the valley like you. God strengthened me. He gave me comfort. He could do it for you. See what I'm saying? So whatever hard if valley that you're going to spend, God is using it so you could turn around and comfort others as you lean on God's comfort and God's strength. Go heal somebody else, amen? Like God heal you. That's the purpose. God has a purpose. He, hey, he controls them. He, he, he allows them and controls them because he has purpose in each one of them. Look. God is using our tribulation, our valleys, to be a blessing to others. So here's my New Year's message to you this morning. There's going to be a lot of valleys this New Year. A lot of valleys. Happy New Year.
Happy New Year, amen? In the world, you should have tribulation. It means you should have peace. Good, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. John 16, 33, Happy New Year, amen? There's going to be valleys. You cannot have, look. You say, well, why be a Christian if the Christian has a lot of valleys? Why be a Christian? Well, you cannot have hills without valleys. You cannot have hills without valleys. If you're going to have a mountain top, you got to be in a valley. Where there's hills, there are valleys next to it. There's valleys next to it. You have to go through the valleys to get to the hilltop. That's just, look, it's only a natural progression that our lives consist of hills and valleys. That's just a natural progression. We've got to learn how to accept it. Because if you want sunshine all the time, you know that all sunshine will make a desert? Yes. I think God is going to bring a little rain in our life. He is. Look, God knows how to balance our life. He knows what we need. We've got to trust him. Yeah, we, we want the mountaintop. We don't want the valley, but God said you need both. You need both, amen? And that's what we need this morning. That's what we need this morning. The land of hill and valley, that's the Christian line. Let's stand on our feet. Every head bow, every eye closed. Okay, think about the message. Here's the, that's the good cheer for the new year. Hey, I'm trying to help you this morning. I'm trying to help myself to start the new year strong. I hope you, hey, one thing about social media is that this is recorded. It's recorded. You go back. When you face a valley, go back and listen to the message again. Amen? It will encourage you. Amen? Every head bow, every eye closed. Look, as the music plays, as, as Janelle plays the piano, we like to give the invitation. If God spoke to your heart, we like to give the invitation to come up here, to the altar here, and, and, and talk to God. I don't know what you're going through. And thank God for the message. Thank, maybe it's one person who did the message this morning. So as the music plays, as the piano plays, if you, need to, if, you, if, you, if you need to make a decision for God and talk to the Lord, that's why we, we, we open the altar, the invitation, so you could, it's time to talk to the Lord. If somebody here is not saved, you're not even saved, you've got big problems. You've got big problems because you're on your own. Come and get saved. Come and get the God of peace living in you. Christ is the source of peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He'll bring you peace and joy. Go ahead, Janelle.